that those words haven't fallen on deaf ears, I would like to invite Ms. Astrid Winters to introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much, um, Governor of the Central Bank, I'll be great. Antonio Roberts, of course, Tony Burnside. Um, IDB, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm at the IDB office here in Nassau. And my task tonight really is to introduce to you the author of this book. We have copies at the back there called The Orange Economy. And this is a book about creativity and innovation. And I won't say more because that's why Felipe Buitrago, <laughs> who is the author of this book, and it's an interesting book. When I first saw it, I thought my 12 year old could read this. And um, people at the office are discussing it. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, Felipe is here, um, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about him. He is a consultant, a colleague at our, the IDB's Cultural Solidarity and Creative, Creativity Affairs Division. And now for over 11 years, he has worked on the development of the orange economy from various angles. He has done this in his capacity as an advisor in the Ministry of Culture of Colombia as a program manager in the British, British Council, as director of the Evo American Observatory of Copyright, and as an independent consultant and university professor. His experience in over a dozen countries around the world includes research, multilateral negotiation, and the design and evaluation of public policy and development programs. He has collaborated on the development of numerous creative economic studies, including the Creative Industries Mapping of Bogota and Creative Lebanon and Una Ventana a la Economía Creativa de Valvay Piso. Um, Mr. Butrago Felipe is an eco economics graduate of Los Andes Univers University in Bogota, Colombia, and he is a passionate amateur historian. He holds a master's also in international public policy from Johns Hopkins in, in the United States. So without further ado, Felipe, you're ready? Um, oh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> you have a, a tech issue, so. But I would like to say thank you very much. I know when you think of IDB, you think of our work in social economic development and uh, partnering with our client countries. Very, very rarely do we think of art uh, or the creative world. Um, and I would like to share with you quickly, as a plot, since I have space, um, that we have been working in the Bahamas in supporting um, the handicraft industry, particularly the straw industry that Mrs. Burnside mentioned, through the creation of something that will be launched, I believe, in a couple of months, called the virtual platform that links, through the BAIC and some other entities, straw um, artists, handicraft artisans, um, to have a platform to display their work internationally via a, a virtual platform. And that's going to be very exciting. So it's something to look out for. You are working on that too. <laughs> and then we also every year have a cultural grant, which is a competition open to me member countries. This year, uh, last year, sorry, Bahamas won for a dance proposal, um, uh, which was about using dance uh, with children who are unattached youth to, to uh, provide an attachment back to the community. So um, I hope you'll think of us when you have interesting ideas. I don't want to overpromise, but uh, we're very keen to engage more with um, the creative arts to the extent that it is possible. So um, we'll hand it over to Ms. Liz in case I think I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before everybody starts, there are a few young ladies here who might wish to rest their legs. Um, there are some seats upstairs. Um, right now, there are five, but I can put another five on. So, so and there are two more. I have to say. Um, well, uh, many of you may ask, 
yourself, I mean, you have the experience of the central bank being involved with art and culture, right? But usually, everybody asks themselves, what development institutions, in particular multilaterals, do for this? And why they should get involved? And, and that's a question that the bank has asked itself before in the past. And, and what is interesting is that maybe asking that question and having a response is something that lets the IDB to stand out from other uh, multilateral development institutions. Why? Mainly because from its beginning, it had a different, different flavor. It, had a, it was the first regional development institution in the world. And in that sense, it came with the idea of Latin America and the Caribbean. And that and made it think about itself around cultural, uh, cultural stance, a different language that what was going on at this time in, in all multilateral negotiations and multilateral development uh, uh, conversations. So having to think in different languages, right now we have four actually, uh, made us think differently. And over time it, had, it made a difference. One of that differences is that uh, since 1992, the bank set up the first so far only cultural center inside a multilateral development institution in the world. This cultural center gets in itself an art collection with more than 1,700 pieces uh, from all the 12, 26 countries from the, that belong to the bank in the in, in sense of being a lender, uh, the borrowing countries, but also from some many others of the, of the lending countries. Uh, what it's interesting about it is this, this cultural center and the, the cultural program from the bank has been acknowledged as one of the top 100 corporate cultural programs in the world. So that's something that makes us really different and that's why, in a way, we get involved into these issues of arts and culture. Now, I'm going to divide my presentation in three parts. I speak fast, not because I'm nervous, I speak really fast. <laughs> <laughs> By nature. It's, it's, it's something that, uh, I, actually there was a joke in school that they were saying that they always needed a, a, a dictionary from Vitrago to Spanish and from Spanish to Vitrago so we can communicate. <laughs> so I try to speak slower, but I get excited about these things and, and I start talking very fast. So I'm going to try to, to slow down, but in any case, hope to, you can bear with me. So uh, this presentation is in three parts because we ask ourselves uh, why, uh, how, what, and why we are in this. So the how, uh, is a story that starts in 1982. 1982 is a pivotal year for the creative economy. Not because the term was coming that year, but it was a, a very strange year for, for culture and creativity. It was the year of the World Cup. Uh, it was also the year of problems in the Middle East. Apparently nothing has changed. <laughs> it was a time of trouble in the region. Fortunately, that has changed in some ways. Uh, but it was also a year in which the world started noticing technology was starting to reshape what we understood as the way to deal with the economy and development. It took 30 years or so to start coming to these conclusions, but it started there. But that's not yet the reason. It was also a year that many people remember because of E.T. or Blade Runner. But 1982 was also a year that came with different colors. It came with diversity in its, in its mindset mostly because in Mexico City, people from all over the world joined together in Mundiacult under the umbrella of UNESCO. And for the first time, the world labeled the economy as an engine for development, an engine for economic welfare. It, took, it is taking 30 years, and, and, and if you think 30 years is quite a short time to get that into, into the mindset of the people, especially politicians and, and, and industry leaders. But it's happening. And in Yakult was the first time that culture and economy were recognized as part of the same and only thing that defines people, you know? And that's very important. That's, that's a very important time. Now, changes doesn't happen fast. So just putting together the idea of, you know, dreams and heritage and ideas, many of them which have no market value, how they relate with the real world where people have to deal with hardships and, and, and material things, you know, I mean, supplying the basic goods. Well, it started taking the, the, the shape with one example. And interesting enough, Glasgow, which used to be just one century before 1990, the second largest industrial city in the world. 
And by 1980, it was totally broken. And it had to reinvent itself. And it happened to reinvent itself around the creative industries without actually knowing they were going to be called creative industries and that there was going to be even, even being a, a big movement around cultural industries or cultural activities as a way to, for development. It was a hunch in a way, but a very well-informed hunch from what we are talking about. But this has, this has also some examples in the region and especially in Argentina and Mexico, some intellectuals starting, started to, to, to build up on this, over these ideas and produce some initial adjustments. However, uh, Argentina and Mexico uh, were going through different transitions and the, their earlier attempts at putting together these ideas failed because of the crisis in the middle of the 90s. But fortunately, there, come, or there came a period of very interesting uh, activities between 1999 and 2002. Uh, institutions like the IDB started to call for action on, this, on, 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 on these ideas. So in particular, the president at the time, Enrique Iglesias, uh, gave a speech in 1988 uh, for uh, the, the, the governors of the bank saying this is something relevant. And fortunately, some people in the region listened. And that people put together a seminar back in 1999 called the third uh, phase of the coin. Could you think you have a coin, and in one side of the coin, you have the, 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 the face value, the number that describes what the coin is worth, right? But on the other side, you always have what you call the face or the heads, you know? It's usually something symbolic. It's, it's something that represents a value that goes beyond the other value. But of course, they're separated. And if you look at coin, it has a third side, a third, a third face of the, of the coin. And that is what we mean by culture and economy, and by creative economy. It's when you put together these two worlds that, that sometimes we can see together, because you can see the, the, the coin from one side or from the other. You have to, to make the effort to actually think about both at the same time. So between these years, something magical happened. Not only Harry Potter, you know, because he was watching that in, in, in that same period of years, but also there came like a Cambrian explosion of ideas from all over the world, and a, a came an explosion of people, institutions getting involved. So you have the creative economy by John Hawkins in the UK, and also the rise of the creative class by, by Richard Florida here in the US, and also another British, Charles Landy with the creative city. And of course, the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, who produced the first uh, world's methodology to try to put some numbers into activities that are uh, ethereal, like culture, in its, this case, really or heavily uh, centered on copyright. But also, other organizations started to, to follow suit. And by 2008, UNCTAD uh, produced the Creative Economy Report. And, and, and it was the first time that a non-cultural organization uh, actually produced such a report around trade. It has, it's, it is, it is, it is, there's a whole debate about it, it, it's numbers and everything because this is a very complicated sector for numbers, but it's, uh, it was a major breakthrough. And also the British Council has been very active at promoting the creative industries and the creative economy across the, around the globe. And they produced this to my the mapping of the creative industries, a toolkit, and uh, an introductory guide for the creative economy. Both of them uh, very, very interesting and very uh, successful in terms of this, their distribution. But it's not only these institutions, it's also governments in the region that started to work on satellite accounts of culture, which uh, in, its, in themselves are very complicated to produce because they are based on the national accounting system. And the national accounting system was designed in the 50s and responds to goods, to things that you can touch. To, to try to understand the world of things that you can't touch, this, the very same system created the notion of satellite accounts in order to complement those systems and make that possible. One of those systems are the satellite accounts of culture, which in the region, right now in Latin America and the Caribbean, we have six of them out of nine in the world. So, uh, and think of them, that the first one was in Colombia, <coughs> the second one was in, in Finland, the third one in Spain, all of the others 
came then in this hemisphere, the last being the Mexican one, and previous to the Mexican one, the United States one. So this is something which the region is actually developing tools that the world needs to learn from. It's not only we receiving how to do things, it's also us sharing our expertise in how to do things. And in culture, we definitely have a lot to share. Uh, but you can see many, many ministries and, 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 and organizations across the region uh, jumping to them, and these are not all. But it's also that we, quite recently, we have actually come to, to, to see that there are many great activities happening. The Creative Cities Network by UNESCO, but also the, the cultural clusters and creative industries clusters in Buenos Aires. You have also observatories in Santiago de Chile and in Colombia and in Argentina. You have also the program <coughs> of Industrias Culturales, Cultural Industries in Cali, uh, a program that was is like the so far the, the highest point completely devoted to that coming from the bank to the to the MIF, the Multilateral Investment Fund, uh, uh, that has created over a hundred uh, in, uh, enterprises in, in the city. And actually, <coughs> yesterday, the day before yesterday, we had one of those companies, a uh, company of musicians from the Pacific, uh, coming to the bank and showcasing what they have achieved so far and how they successfully have become because of this orientation and how to understand this as a business. Uh, and also in Santiago de Chile, we have a, an amazing program that is actually teaching and learning how to go to the world and look for markets to entrepreneurs. Uh, but the bank has been very fortunate to, to have partners that are very close to us in Washington. One is the organization of the United States, and the other, the British Council, but also the American University. And in the region, we are uh, starting to, to rely on partners like the Convention of Brisbane. And this brought us to last year, in 2013, to produce these two documents, the Orange Economy and the, and the Economic Impact of the Creative Industries in the Americas. Both documents available on the internet, both documents uh, very interesting. They are based in the same database, but two different ways to read it. The, the Orange Economy is very accessible, is designed for people uh, of any background to approach it and to learn the language of the creative economy and also to make it its own. And the impact of the creative economy, of the creative industries in the Americas is designed to understand for technical people what is missing in information and why it's important for us to take action in producing those numbers so we can understand better the sector and take better informed decisions. So this pretty much is also translating now into a system we're creating in the bank. Is the, the information, cultural information system of the Americas. Uh, this system is going about to be launched and includes information of non-monetary uh, quantitative uh, variables from all the 26 borrowing countries in the IDB. All the 26. We, are put, we have put together <coughs> the most complete database of information about uh, attendance to museums, attendance to theater, movies, TV viewers, um, cell phone <coughs> ownership across the 26 countries and give the user the opportunity to mix these variables and make its own conclusions about the correlations that may exist there and so demand more information so 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 the governments need to produce that information and, and better information and better decisions have to take. So that's how this is becoming relevant and important and how, how we are taking on the, on the on the challenge of answering to these questions. But now what is the creative economy? What is the creative industries? Well, for starters, industries like publishing, right? I mean, books, writing books is, is something creative. And it has, uh, it has a material um, expression. In particular, books and, and book printing is probably the oldest industry in the world. And it's also the oldest creative industry. It was the first mass reproduction activity by a machine that I did, at least I can remember. And it's about five, 500 years old, but also uh, it's also a cultural industry. And book printing gave birth over 200 years to the notion of copyright. Because it was being the first time you can reproduce content, that you can reproduce ideas, then it created the challenge. How you recognize, how you acknowledge the authors of those, of those works. But it's also activities like theater, 
but they have these very nice monumental spaces where we can have great shows live and dances and music of all kinds that are amazing, right? But there's also crafts. Sometimes crafts uh, don't seem so useful, but they gave us a notion of our past, something that tie us to our ancestors and to our, our, our identity from, 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 from other times, but also give us the chance to reinvent that identity and to adapt it to, to, the, to the world through design, for instance. Uh, films, of course, movies, television, uh, all audiovisual productions are part of this industry. But also, untouchable things, like heritage carnivals, things that are completely, totally, utterly uh, in, in the air, and they happen only because of the will of people that put together the shows and the, and the logistics uh, and the knowledge to make it happen, and, but also the heritage that comes with all, these, with all these ideas and all these celebrations of the past. And of course, video games. Maybe the, the, the most strong, the strongest of the of the new creative industries, in, worth about a hundred billion dollars right now in the world, um, and and it's really engaging to very creative activities, and it comes in a combination with audiovisuals, music, uh, crafts, uh, storytelling, name it, and of course, combination of all of this with new technologies, new ways to understand the world that surrounds us, new ways to interact with each other and to share our values and to learn from each other and to get positively infected of other people's ways to see the world and to evolve our ways and to infect the others with our way to see the world and construct together uh, the things. So, of course, we need to measure this. And to measure this, to measure this orange is very difficult. So, we propose to approach it by a pyramid of statistics that starts with mapping. Mapping by actually doing research like, like Pan's uh, work shown today, trying to tell us where is this information, where are these businesses, what are they producing, and how we can improve the production of that. By understanding the gaps of the information, we can then improve our basic statistics. The service we use to measure the economy, so we start understanding it better. But of course, because the statistics alone is not is not is not is not uh, is not enough. You need to use that statistic and, and, and organize the results of these numbers into information. That information comes in the form of satellite accounts of culture, which I mentioned before, and, and that starts giving you an accumulated picture of the data that is produced. That accumulated picture is what is really matter because what you can draw from the information and try to find trends and understand what affected what and what makes a better policy and what makes a better intervention and what is not working. You need information to evaluate properly if you are using well your resources or not. And of course, once you have this information, in order to track what's going on, you create indicators. And those indicators will tell you if people is reading more, if people is enjoying better their arts, if people uh, is actually consuming in a better way the culture and the arts around them, and if the creativity that derives from this consumption is a creativity that is translated into business opportunities, into employment, into welfare. And finally, once you have all your, your docs in line, you can set up information systems that really uh, uh, allow you to make real-time decision real decisions with uh, information that is, that is reliable, constant, and compatible. Uh, now, we don't know too much about this numbers so far, but we know something. We know that about 6% of the world's output is creative and cultural industries. And that, if it was a country, would be the fourth largest economy, 4.3 trillion US dollars in, in GDP. That's 20% larger than the German economy, is two and a half times the world's military expenditures. So why is that? a sector that is so invisible for most people, probably because we have not measured it enough. What you can't measure, you can't make exist in the public debate. So we need to measure it better so we can be sure about these numbers and be sure we are not challenged by, by the difficulty to know the numbers of the, of the sector. Now, if this sector, where a country will be the ninth largest exporter in the world, 646 billion US dollars in exports. 
That's about twice the exports of oil of Saudi Arabia. That's not a small feat. And if it were a country, it would be the fourth largest uh, labor force. About the same number of employments that the United States generates. 144 million of people is right now working one way or another with the creative and, economic and cultural industries. So for Latin America and the Caribbean together, it's 177 billion dollars, about the size of the whole of the Peruvian economy. About 21 billion dollars in exports, about the size of the Panamanian uh, exports, and about 11.5 million employments, about the combined labor forces of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. It's huge. Uh, but now, what about the Caribbean? Well, like in the rest of Latin America and the rest of the world, numbers are sketchy, but we have some numbers. We have numbers that tell us that in terms of GDP, about 4.6% about of the Caribbean GDP comes from the creative industries. And about 3.7% of its employment come from the creative industries. So it's not uh, an invisible, uh, it's invisible, but it's not a negligible part of the economy. It's quite important, especially if you consider that the whole manufacturing sector of the United States is about the same size of the whole creative sector of the United States. So, so it's, it's, it's big. But just to give you some references of how big this sector can be, think between 1982, the same year as Nudia and the year 2012, 30 years in the middle. If you see, the, the youth have not changed that much in the sense that they want this, this cultural <coughs> content, this cultural products, this cultural goods and services. Mm -hmm. Of course, it has changed the, 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 the name of those who, who they prefer, but also has changed that in those 30 years, the people that can access this kind of products in the region has multiplied by four. And about 50 million people have left poverty in the region in the last 10 years. That's quite a lot of people that is wanting to consume better and more tailor-made cultural products. People want identity once they, they, they fulfill their basic needs. And this identity comes in the way of clothes, in the way of movies, television, video games, apps, name it. You have here a big opportunity, a big challenge to provide these young people and the, uh, the elders, of course, with these contents. Because it's not only young people consuming, but they are coming, and they are coming in a strength. Uh, but if you see this, this is the Three Gorges Dam in China. It's the largest energy plant in the world. It took 30 years, the same 30 years between 1982 and 2012, to be designed and built. It produces about 10% of the Chinese energy, 28 million houses and <coughs> thousands of businesses. It cost $25 billion to produce. In the same 10 year, 20, 30 years, the top 10 musicals in Broadway sold $27 billion in entries and uh, merchandising. So, not bad for theater, right? <laughs> no, no, no. it's not only that. It's also cities like Buenos Aires, where one in ten uh, jobs are in the creative industries. And nine out of every hundred pesos generated come from the creative industries. It's also things like the Carnaval in Rio. Carnival in Rio attracts hundreds of thousands of tourists per year and generates, outside of the activities of the carnival, over $600 million in revenues for the city. So again, not negligible. But then comes the reason. Why is all of this important? I can't tell you this is important because of the money, because of the jobs, because of the trade and whatever. But that's the real reason why this is important. We are in a transition right now. And this transition is about how, uh, back in the 19th century, we had an industrial revolution. And that industrial revolution was about producing or mass producing with high inputs of capital, uh, goods that are pretty much all the same. Uh, and we as a region, <coughs> all Latin America and the Caribbean, we were late for that. In fact, many of us have never jumped into that, into that opportunity. And then, uh, early in the, in the 20th century came up. 
uh, an electric revolution, the technology revolution. And all of us have jumped into it, but quite late in most of the cases. And, 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 and trying to catch up with the production of liquid domestic has not been our strength. But today we have an opportunity, and that opportunity is that this digital revolution is only now coming. And we are not so far from others to understand it and to jump into it. We have the human capital, everybody has talent. We have lots of talent. And the thing is, can we nurture that talent and harness its, harness its potential to translate it into real economic opportunities and welfare? Well, then we have to ask why we should do that. And I think a story can tell you better than numbers. And I want to tell you a story of an Argentinian boy. Think of this boy born in the end of the 50s, in the middle of, uh, I don't know, the, the imports, um, substitution policies of the times. Everybody was thinking about manufacturers in Latin America and the Caribbean. We were all thinking about how we get the big factories that they create the jobs that can pay for the, for the big government working. And this boy grew up in this environment. So of course, uh, he was conditioned by the, by, the, by the environment to make decisions. But he got in love, he fell in love with films, Kubrick, uh, Hitchcock, and, 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 and he wanted it so much. But, of course, family pressure, he started, he started to study engineering. After one year of engineering, he was pretty much wanting to kill himself. And somehow, <laughs> and somehow he managed to put together a very bad movie with some friends. <laughs> of course, it was a total failure, uh, but he did, not, he did not got discouraged by this failure. Actually, he realized that his dream was to overcome that failure and to make real movies. And then he set himself a target, a very, very big dream. So he dropped engineering after one year, after actually after two more, more than two years of studying, and devoted himself to film. So he decided to study. He came to New York and to other places, uh, made friends. Part of making friends took him to produce some of the Law and Order uh, uh, series in, in, the in the late 90s. And he managed to put together a couple of very good movies. And these good two movies were very successful. Juan Jose Campanella managed to put uh, a an amazing couple of movies, and one of them, in Secreto de sus Ojos, gave him the Oscar for the best uh, foreign movie. And you cannot believe this was not his dream. His dream, remember he was a child back in the 50s and 60s, his dream was to make the most amazing movie in Latin America that was animated. And he fulfilled this dream last year with Metegol. In Spanish it's football, in English it's football or something like that. This movie is so far the most expensive and the most uh, complex Latin American and Caribbean movie ever. $25 million. This is Hollywood standards. And it's been a success all over the place. But Campanella is not an isolated case. You have also Aquaron. He also had a dream. His dream from very early in his life was to make a movie about the space that was not science fiction. And gravity is right now the first Oscar for a director that is from the region. But not only that, it's a huge success in, 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 in the box office. So I remember that by the fourth or fifth week, it was over the $500 million mark for the first time so fast. So that's amazing, right? And they are not alone. You have also Guillermo Toro and many others who are following, and, and that is actually good news for the region, because it means that a lot of people are dreaming and following their dreams and making it happen big time. Of course, the big time players are not the only people that matters. And this guy, so anybody knows who this guy is? This guy uh, is Guy Liberte. He's a Canadian who had a dream. Back in 1984, he got a grant from the Canadian Council of the arts, and with that grant, he started something amazing, the Cirque du Soleil. Mm. And the Cirque du Soleil today is the largest performing arts company in the world. Over 5,000 employees and more than 
$800 million in revenues. That's massive. That's big for any standard, for any kind of company in the world. But what matters here, and for the region, is not if we can have a Cirque du Soleil or 10 Cirque du Soleils. What matters here is the inspiration that it gives us and the, the, the world that it shows to us. And some of those inspiration has been translated in things like El Pau Aplauso in Rio de Janeiro, where the IDB has supported this initiative that have helped kids, young kids, in the favelas of Rio to find a different way to engage in life, different than gangs, drug trafficking, or violence. And it's been wildly successful. But not only there, also Cir Circo Ciudad in Bogotá. Same case study, in, in, not in the favelas, but in Ciudad Bolívar, the largest, at some point it was the largest uh, in, in slum in, in Colombia. And now they are a, a, a positive example of leadership that takes kids away from, from, from poverty and violence, but also that is bridging the gaps between the society, a society that is, that is hugely uh, divided by these kind of, of ideas of, of classes. Okay? And also, Caricato, very similar in Lima. Amazing, another great example. But there's one that is my favorite, actually, okay? which is the, 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 the Landfill Orchestra. That, the Landfill Harmonic Orchestra. And the Landfill Harmonic <coughs> Orchestra is actually called the Cateura Orchestra of Recycled Instruments. It comes from Paraguay, from the <coughs> largest uh, landfill in Paraguay, just outside of Asuncion. The poorest part, or among the poorest parts in Latin America and the Caribbean you can find. And these kids, living into garbage, were blessed by a failed attempt by the bank to, to, to do a project. So they were doing a prospective uh, analysis for some intervention that was deemed it's not going to work, so it's better not to, to mess with this. But one of the specialists sent by the bank to do the perspective around the, 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 the Cateura area was also a musician. And in his talks to the community, he found that the talent of these kids in this, in this land was amazing. And he committed himself and started getting some funds and, and, and support to set up this orchestra that plays only instruments made out of recycled materials found in this landfill. This orchestra was the last year in Washington, brought by the bank in the Kennedy Center in the stage. More than 3,000 people in Washington enjoyed this, and it was, let me tell you, truly exciting. And it's very, I mean, this may go, God not just remember that. But it has more power than that. Just recently, this very orchestra has been working as opening the concerts of Metallica <laughs> in South America. <laughs> Metallica is big. And these guys were on stage with Metallica. So that's amazing, right? So the thing is, or the big message I want to let you know is keep calm. This is only the beginning. It's been 30 years right so far, and we have probably 30 more years ahead. <laughs> but we need to, see, to keep working. We need to keep the dream on. And to keep that dream on, I want you to help me squeeze this orange. <laughs> Download the orange economy, right? Share it with friends, right? And of course, let us tell the world that working in the creative economy, being a creative, being an artist, is a real job. So let's spread the word. Thank you very much.
how do you how does the bank advise countries that are interested in developing creative economies? How do they advise those countries on, on how to develop uh, creative economies and how to get the different ministries to work together and to develop ministries and to change the educational system? How how does that conversation happen? <laughs> 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 In, in the Caribbean islands, uh, there are some particular challenges that are very different from the, from the main challenges in, in the Spanish-speaking uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Mostly the size of the countries. And while, while most of the, of the, with the big exception of Jamaica and Haiti, I think all the other uh, islands are very small in terms of population, usually below the mark of two million inhabitants, and often around half a million or less. So that poses challenges. Uh, uh, still, you will find that the same patterns that you find in some Latin American countries uh, are also seen in the Caribbean. In terms of initiatives taken by, by creatives, uh, you see the, the, the literature festivals arising in the Caribbean, including that, the Bocas Festival, is very, pretty much, comparable to anything happening in the continental areas that we have. Uh, plus, it comes uh, with the added value of the diversity of the Caribbean, which comes with, uh, with the Spanish heritage, right? But also with the English heritage, the African heritage, and the Indian heritage. So it's, it, is, it is very diverse and very colorful, and it comes with amazing stories that come from pirates to modern times and migrations to the US and Europe. So, so it's, it's an amazing uh, space for, for these conversations. I, I went, I was in Barbados about three years ago, not two years ago, and I, I was truly really amazed with the Calypso, and especially because of the, the very clever use of this deep cultural uh, activity, highly efficient for entertainment, but with a twist in education. It's called edutainment. And I was really surprised uh, and, and positively like, like affected by, by how there was a topic every year that was picked that was of social benefit. Sometimes it's prevention or education for women or something like that. And there was an extra uh, um, award in the contest for the king and the queen and the king of is king of or queen of Calypso because that's also what's very interesting. I want to go back to that. But that whoever had the best like show portraying the topic pick for that year got a very good award. And also called my attention that there was no difference in the competition between women and men. They were competing in equal conditions, and it was very common for women to win as well. So it was a way to show that how the creative industries through Meritocracy gives the way. I mean, it is, is where it is, it's one of those. This is one of the industries where you don't have to worry that much about creating a special conditions to, to 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 highlight the role of women. It's one of those areas where the the, the, the the naturally competition is real and opportunities are very similar, uh, and you can find that in, across across the spectrum. Uh, I I. I learned about many initiatives in, in Jamaica some years ago, uh, uh, especially around music, of course, but also around <coughs> connecting you know, the heritage of, this, of the island with the production of the special coffees, trying to, to highlight you know, the relationship between the rhythm and the, and the, and the, the flavor or, the, or the, the flow of Jamaicans with other uh, products. And you will find many, many, many of these examples across the region. Some smaller, some bigger. I mean, it, 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 that's amazing. And um, then, what was <laughs> What happened in Mexico? Well, that's okay, in Mexi in Mexico, we had the tequila effect. I mean, Mexico did, uh, was making a, a big transition in its model in the economy. They signed in 1994 uh, free trade agreement with the United States and Canada. And part of that agreement, uh, had a, a result not expected in a big influx of capitals. And after a year and a half, 
people realize, oh, there's too much capital in, in the country. So a lot of people started withdrawing the, the capital and that made collapse the financial system, pretty much like what happened in, in 2008. And fortunately, at the time, the US uh, stepped in and, 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 and gave a guarantee to all the <coughs> deposits and everything and saved the system, but that had a, it had a domino effect in many spheres. And one of those spheres is that people became, again, very worried of, of, of economy, economic prospects. And when that happens, people usually go to hide in the traditional industries. So people that was looking for, that were looking for the creative industries and, and alternative ways to develop the economy, they just stepped down. And that actually discouraged many academics working in the field. In Argentina, uh, it was not the same thing. Argentina uh, is a very interesting economy. Uh, has the has very deep cycles, uh, and people always say that there are good ways to manage the economy, there are bad ways to manage the economy, and there's the Argentinian way because <laughs> nobody understands it. And seriously, uh, it's very difficult to predict. You only you only can predict that the cycle is going to be abrupt. They're going to have very very uh, good growth averages for about six, seven years, then they go stagnant, and at some point, out of the blue, they collapse. We are starting to understand it better, but that happened uh, around 2005 again, as probably as, as, a, as a byproduct of the Mexican um, uh, crisis. The Argentinians suffered it because people always say, something's going wrong, let's look to Argentina, and something happened. They, they recover relatively fast, but again, like in Mexico, it made a lot of people retreat from these, these approaches. Uh, the, good, the good news was that many countries uh, were very stable at the, at the time, like, uh, like Chile and Colombia and Peru, and, and, and were able to pick up the topic and, 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 and move it forward until the mid of the last decade where other countries started to, to, to joining in, and that gave actually the bank the, the opportunity to, to promote some of these activities and some of this research like the, uh, the Satellite Account of Culture. The Satellite Account of Culture has a manual that was financed by the bank back uh, between 2005 and 2009. So, so that's it. Now, what's going on in terms of coordination in the region for an institutional build-up? Uh, interestingly enough, uh, if you go back 30 years, uh, very few countries in the region had actual ministries of culture or a big national uh, institution around culture. Uh, in that sense, uh, the Caribbean and Latin America uh, are late adopters of the European model of having a <coughs> institution in the center uh, caring for culture. It was, it was usually an office or, or an annex office to the Ministry of Education. Uh, now, pretty much all the region <coughs> has a big office in that sense, or if that office is not totally independent as a ministry, is at least something attached to the president's or to the prime minister's office, which is, is good enough to, to, to make it relevant. Uh, now, of course, the first approach is go for the tradition. Let's try to map out which carnivals we have, uh, what are our cultural traditions, uh, the languages we have, and in that sense, it has been very successful. Uh, in terms of, of understanding the economy, well, part of creating these, these institutions is starting to produce the results of getting better numbers. Those numbers, what we have already put together, is part of what we're trying to, to showcase with the CICLAN, with the information, cultural information system of the Americas. Uh, but that information is not nearly enough. It's not nearly enough. Uh, some of, something that we need to figure out together, as a region and as the multilateral organizations, is how we can produce those numbers for the long run. Because it's not good enough to make some mapping. We need to keep doing mapping. But, but, but it's not going to be enough. We need to really think how we can uh, put together ideas that are practical and feasible to understand the real numbers behind this, the microeconomics of it, uh, so we can produce uh, real answers. In the meantime, we have the examples coming from, from the UK, for instance, and in some cases, uh, cities like Barcelona or, B or Bilbao or, or, or even uh, cities like, like, like Varsovia, who are thinking differently uh, and are actually putting together uh, different ways to do the thing. One case that is very interesting for me and I really, really like is Estonia. Estonia is doing really interesting stuff. They are, they are really articulating uh, the works of the society with, uh, with the new technologies 
and making that appealing by by making by giving it the flavor of their culture and uh, of the tradition that they live. And that is something that I think should be a, 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 the very model for many of us to follow. But again, we are just starting. So, so this is an open discussion. That's why it's important for you to help us spread the word and ignite these debates, because we don't have all the answers right now. We, we, we have only questions, just as much as you, and, and we need to, to find those answers to you. A question. Uh, yeah. You mentioned it quite significant. Um, the portion of the GDP of some of these countries is due to culture. The question is, what percentage of the government budget goes into uh, GDP, goes into culture? That's something that is not yet very clear. Uh, many ministries of culture are too recent. Uh, many cultural programs uh, are very decentralized sometimes, and information is not so readily available. This, that's part of what we want to find uh, in the next couple of years, trying to put together that information, because it's very relevant, it's very important. I mean, we know some countries where that number can be relatively big, about 0.3 or 0.4 percent of the GDP, which is quite a lot uh, for for government budget. Uh, but that's it's very difficult to make a case with only two or three examples. I mean, right now what we have is based on about. 26 countries of the 35 in the Americas, uh, and, it's, and the cover about 95 percent, 98 percent of the economy, and 96 percent of the population. But, but for 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 the ministries of culture, the public budget is very difficult, especially because because not only a ministry of culture is the source of funding for the for the cultural arts. Sometimes it comes like in the central bank here. In the Central Bank in Colombia uh, and other organizations in, in other parts. Even sometimes you can find that the military is involved in providing some cultural services in certain areas of countries. So putting it down together, that information is very difficult and is something that we really need to figure out so we can advise better that kind of policies. Okay. Thank you very much. and the organizers of tonight's program for allowing the Central Bank to host the program. We were invited a few days ago to host and we are quite happy that we had the opportunity to host this program tonight. We thank you all for coming and we wish you a good night. Those of you who may wish to browse the gallery, we are open for a few more minutes. And um, of course, you can always come any day of the week and have a look at what is here tonight. But again, we thank you. And on behalf of the governor, uh, the board of the bank, and the management and staff of the bank, um, we always welcome you to participate in the events that we have. Thank you. Good night.